Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, today we celebrate Richard Schrager's appointment as the Perry Bowen Professor of Law. The chair honors Mr. Bowen of the law school class of 1928 and was established in 1990 with a bequest from his estate. Mr. Bowen made his career in private practice and in government service, including stints as an Army intelligence officer uh, and an attorney in the War Department. Clay Gillette was the first holder of the chair, followed by George Triantis and Alex Johnson. The current Perry Bowen professor, Rich Schrager, holds an undergraduate degree from Penn, an MA from University College London, and a JD from Harvard. After law school, he clerked for Judge Dolores Slavater on the Third Circuit, practiced at Miller Cassidy in Washington, DC, and served as a visiting professor at Georgetown before joining our faculty in 2001. Rich writes in the areas of local government law, particularly its constitutional and economic implications, and law and religion, although as many of you in the room know, his work also touches on property law, of which he is an exceptional teacher. He combined all these strands in one of his earliest articles, The Role of the Local in the Doctrine and Discourse of Religious Liberty, published in the Harvard Law Review in 2005. The article makes a point that runs through all of Rich's scholarship, that discussions of the relative roles of federal and state governments often ignore local government, and consequently their conclusions may be suspect when we bring local government into the picture. In the case of laws potentially burdening the exercise of religion, the common assumption is that the states being closer to the day-to-day -day consequences of religious conflict are more inclined than the federal government to suppress unpopular religions. The federal government is thus needed to check the state's impulse to reduce religious conflict by regulating religious practice. That is the canonical normative case for applying the First Amendment's religion clauses through incorporation to the states. But, as Rich notes, both in theory and practice, the regulations to which the post-incorporation religion clauses have been applied are mostly adopted at the local rather than the state level. And this is just as the theory would pre predict. Local governments are closest of all to conflicts between majority and minority religious norms. But Rich argues, contrary to the local to the usual conclusion that this decentralization produces less rather than more of the harms that the religion clauses seek to prevent. Structurally, local regulations are both diverse in content and modest in reach. Local governments, unlike states or the national government, do not have the power to benefit or burden religion in the sweeping way the founders contemplated. Rich argues that First Amendment doctrine should pay attention to the scale and scope of challenged burdens on religious exercise, which it does not do currently. Rich's scholarship deals not only with federal restraints on local governments, but state-level restraints as well. One of his recent articles, Democracy and Debt, published in the Yale Law Journal, observes that after a wave of municipal debt crises in the 19th century, states attempted through constitutional provisions, such as debt ceilings and balanced budget mandates, to restrict borrowing at both the state and local level. Thus, the states ended the 19th century with fiscal constitutions that imposed structural limitations on state and local fiscal policy. And of course, lenders learned from their experience with cities and altered lending practices accordingly. Rich argues that both structural and market constraints have failed to prevent state and municipal fiscal crises. The reason, he contends, is that overborrowing is not principally a manifestation of agency problems in which politicians spend for personal but not social benefit, or to appease current voters while shifting costs to future taxpayers. Instead, he argues, state and local fiscal crises are the result of economic shocks, and those shocks are often not efficiently priced. As a consequence, Rich argues, states' fiscal constitutions are premised on a fallacy that state and local governments will inevitably engage in excessive borrowing unless constrained by structural factors. 
He concludes that ordinary political processes are sufficient both to ensure a reasonable degree of prudence on the front end and sensible strategies for resolving debt crises on the back end. Today's lecture will address a more general, at a more general level the question of the capacity of localities for self-governance. It will be informed by a wealth of detailed examination of particular issues in local government law in which Rich has engaged over the past decade. Please join me in welcoming the Perry Bowen Professor of Law, Rich Schrager. Thank you so much, Dean Mahoney. It's, um, when you're he you hear your work uh, described back to you by the dean, it just sounds so fabulous and <laughs> smart. And so I, will, I hope to, to meet that, that test that you've set out. Uh, uh, but it's, um, it's really terrific. I'm putting my watch down so I don't go over too long. Thank you so much uh, for coming out, uh, particularly my students who are here. Uh, I know that um, you're missing bar review behind me. So just don't, don't look too far into the distance. And thank you to the faculty that's here and all my friends. Um, I, I realized the other day that I'm going on 13 years on this faculty, on the same faculty. Uh, uh, the appointment was 2001, and I arrived here in 2002. And I'm stunned that that amount of time has gone by. Um, all of my colleagues have stayed exactly looking the same. And I think I have aged. Um, but to be a part of this incredible intellectual community has just been a, uh, an honor for me and a privilege. And my work has, uh, has um, been made better and, and, and uh, smarter by the interactions with everyone uh, here and uh, students, faculty, and friends, and so on. I'm really grateful for everything that you've done. Um, this talk comes an opportune moment for two reasons. The first reason is in the last few decades, we have seen the extremes of urban decline and urban resurgence. Uh, Detroit filed the largest municipal bankruptcy in US history, and a handful of other general purpose municipalities have filed since 2010. Many other municipalities are in various states of receivership or otherwise distressed. Meanwhile, many older industrial cities have seen their populations stabilize and even increase after decades of decline. Globalization has perhaps surprisingly coincided with a significant urban resurgence. This has raised questions about uh, rising inequality in places like New York City and San Francisco and initiated debates about the ability and desirability for cities to address pressing social issues. The recent election of Bill de Blasio is an example of these issues being aired in a public way. The second reason that this talk comes in a, at an opportune moment is that I've just received a book contract, so I have to figure out what to say, and you're going to help me. So I'm trying this out on you. Let me know how it goes. All right, can cities govern? We could also have a subtitle, and do we want them to? Uh, I'll address both. First, I'll tell you why this question is an important one, not just for policymakers, but also for folks interested in institutional design. And then the second part of the talk uh, will answer the question at least tentatively. Uh, can cities govern? Yes, a hesitant yes. Do we want them to? Yes, that's the point. My claim is that scholars and policymakers have generally misunderstood the nature and origin of the constraints on city power. They have generally underestimated the city's capabilities. Cities can do less of the things that conventional wisdom thinks they can, and more of the things that conventional wisdom thinks they can't. Now let me make two, uh, two side notes before we get too deep into this. One, the city is a term of art. I use it in a similar way that we use terms like nation state or state. Nation state and states, they're all different from one another. They're different size. They have different powers. They have different institutional settings. Cities are also different. Yet, we can still treat them as identifiable political and conceptual units. Second, when I talk about governance, I'm not referring to the question of who exercises power in the city. The title of the talk does play on a famous book by Robert Dahl, 
called Who Governs, a book written in 1961 about New, ha New Haven. And in that book, Dahl talks about the exercise of power inside the city of New Haven, who exercises it, who runs the show. I'm not asking that. What I'm asking is, regardless of who exercises power in the city, is the city itself at mercy of forces over which it has no control, or can citizens acting through their elected officials pursue and achieve outcomes that they favor? So that's my, my question for today. So let me start with uh, the question of why should we care if cities can govern? And I'm going to give you four reasons. Uh, the first is policy. The policies one might recommend to a city will turn in large part on whether one believes that city policies can actually change the course of a city's future. Figuring out what a city is capable of doing is thus a prerequisite for offering solutions to the city's problems. Policymakers and theorists constantly urge cities to pursue certain objectives on the assumption that those objectives are attainable but they might not be. Can a city improve the material well-being of its citizens, weather economic booms and busts, encourage development, secure employment, provide basic services, and adopt effective rules and regulations that are responsive to a citizen's desires? We often act as if cities can do at least some of these things, but it is not obvious that cities can do any of them. The scholarship on cities often vacillates between treating cities as powerless to act and blaming cities for their failures. On the powerless to act side, we think about deindustrialization. De so Douglas Ray has a recent book, again, about New Haven. These are all Yale academics, so that's all they write about. And his argument is that industrial cities like New Haven existed in a particular technological time. And when that te technological time passed, that was the end of those cities. That's the powerless to act. On the other hand, we often talk about cities as if they're blameworthy. So when we think about Detroit's recent bankruptcy or in New York City in the 1970s, we often blame mismanagement or corruption. When cities succeed, we sometimes say, oh, the mayor made good choices. And when cities fail, we sometimes say, oh, that was bad luck. We often flip those as well. So that's the first reason, policy. The second reason is federalism. How power is distributed between municipal government and the state and federal governments turns in part on what we think cities can do and how much we trust them to achieve certain ends. In the United States, we have a political culture that simultaneously celebrates and denigrates local power. Despite repeated invocations of local control, municipal power in particular is often suspect. American cities are often viewed as inconsequential stepchildren, poor political units, not very uh, 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 robust as compared to states and the nation. Implicit in the city's lower status is a set of assumptions about the city's capabilities as compared to other levels of government. In law schools, we are particularly blind to local government. Yet 63% of all government employees work for local governments. And local expenditures are quite high. $1.6 trillion is spent at the local level. It's not as much as the state level, which is $2 trillion, or the federal level, which is $3.4 trillion, but it's still quite significant. Where cities should fit in in the scheme of federalism is an important question. In the discourse about the costs and benefits of decentralized power, federalism and localism are often confused. Just think about Justice Rehnquist in U.S. versus Morrison, where he says there must be a distinction between, quote, what is truly national and what is truly local. What he means to a local government theorist is there should be a distinction between what is truly national and what is truly state, not what is truly local. Federalism, I contend, should be understood as more capacious than the formal federalism of the U.S. Constitution, which only recognizes state sovereignty. And so here I use federalism to mean the division of authority between center and periphery, however divided up, and this is, a, in the United States, a three-tiered federalism, with cities as important components, 
if not constitutionally, at least institutionally. Third reason to look at city power is what I call public and the relationship between public and private power. Looking at the city illuminates an important connection between public and private power. The city is an economic concept as well as a political one. A city comes to be when there are economic gains from propinquity, from proximity of people and firms. Some economists call this agglomeration. A city does not exist independently of the private asset holders who build there, work there, and reside there. The city develops in tandem with private investment, commercial activity, and capital formation, with the in-migration of people and investment. And the history of the development of the city and the law's attempts to regulate it show a fairly clear-eyed understanding that business and the city are interdependent. Business uses the city to promote private agendas, and the city uses business to promote public ones. The result has been judicial vacillation, a legal structure that privileges private economic ordering, but is ambivalent about how public power should be used to promote, develop, and otherwise attract economic resources. So consider 19th and early 20th century efforts to limit city power. The dean mentioned a few of these. Debt limitations, public purpose requirements, bans on special legislation. These don't have any real analogs at the federal level. They were intended to prevent giveaways to vested interests, railroads, utilities, etc. Limiting city power was understood to be a way of protecting vulnerable property owners. Consider also contemporary tax and expenditure limitations on localities and recent controversies over economic development takings, the famous Kelo versus New London case. In Kelo, the court upheld a taking for economic development purposes, and yet there was quite a bit of controversy and then reaction to that. The concern, of course, there was corrupt insiders taking advantage of uh, of innocent property owners. We also have cases like Daimler Chrysler versus Kuno, in which the controversy is over uh, in-state tax subsidies that favor in-city industries. The city's relationship to private capital is fraught. Capital is necessary, but also corrupting. And so the exercise of local power often smacks of corruption, understood broadly as the use of public monies for private ends. And so one view is that cities are properly constrained by legal doctrines intended to prevent their officers from overcommitting resources to corporate capital or redistributing resources from one group to another. Centralizing authority at higher levels of government or in the judiciary prevents local overreaching. But central authorities are also, uh, can also be captured by capital. And so historically, we have sometimes given power back to cities. This cycling is predictable. The economic problem of capital drives the political problem of how to divide up government authority. This is the constitutional problem. The current legal limits on city power in the United States and the division of authority between cities and states are best understood as a reaction to the political pathologies that arise from the city-capital relationship. Finally, participatory democracy. Inquiring into the city's capabilities will tell us about the possibilities for democracy more generally. For my purposes, whether a city can govern is initially an economic question. Can a city affect its economic fate? But the question of city government, governance is ultimately and most importantly a democratic one. Even the best governed city cannot be said to be self-governing if its citizens and their elected officials can do little to stem the city's economic decline or advance its growth. If the city's economic well-being turns on factors well beyond the control of city policymakers, then city governance is going to be quite limited. And so asking about the city's capacity to control its economic fate is a way of asking whether local participatory governance in smaller scale settings is possible. The increased mobility of capital and the acceleration in global markets has, has led some to question 
the nation state's regulatory capacity. Decision making appears to be migrating away from democratic institutions to global markets. And some have asked whether citizens have any role to play in the governance of their political communities. We do not have to defend the city as the ideal location for participatory govern governance to recognize that it has a better chance to produce a robust form of local democracy than does the nation state. And so if municipal governance is passe in a global age, then so are the possibilities, I think, for democratic self-government. So to sum up, there are four reasons that city governance matters. The first is policy. What policy should we recommend city leaders? Second is federalism. What is the appropriate distribution of power between levels of government? The third is capital. What is the appropriate relationship between public and private power? And the fourth is participatory democracy. Is local participatory governance possible? OK, so let me turn to the question of the city's capacity to govern. The conventional view of the city's capabilities begin with mobility. Specifically, the mobility of skilled persons, investment, and capital. On this view, the, in the world of mobile capital, territorially limited local jurisdictions and the citizens who live in them can only weakly counter large-scale economic processes like deindustrialization, suburbanization, and globalization. Plant closings, the movement of manufacturing to the south or overseas, the movement of persons out of old cold cities to new warm ones or out of cities into suburbs, while potentially painful, are unavoidable consequences of relatively open economic markets. Thus, the processes of economic restructuring have left formerly heroic places like Detroit to wither and die, while people move to the suburbs and production shifts to the Sun Belt and across the ocean. Capital will flee aggressive efforts to regulate. Thus, urban politics must invariably be biased in favor of capital. Cities must be business friendly, while robust economic regulation, in particular redistribution, must take place at a higher level of government. Indeed, much of the literature on urban law and policy continues to revolve around four interlocking ideas that reinforce the notion that the city is a relatively unimportant site for collective democratic action. The first idea is that cities are essentially products in continuous competition to attract and retain value, uh, high value persons and businesses. This is what I call the competitive model. The second, Closely related to the first is that cities can improve their economic prospects by adopting good policies, namely minimal redistributive taxation, relatively low levels of economic regulation, and policies that attract and subsidize mobile capital. The third idea is that politics in the city is limited to issues involving development, and that most other important decisions must be made at higher levels of government. And the fourth idea is that the city's need for capital means that, as a result of economic imperatives, cities and their citizens have a relatively narrow range of policy options to choose from. I want to challenge these four ideas and a number of others that flow from them. First, I argue that the competitive paradigm that treats cities as products is mistaken. Second, I argue that Good policies, many of which are deregulatory to some degree, have much less to, to do with good economic outcomes than is often assumed. Third, I argue that cities can do both more of the things that conventional wisdom thinks they cannot and less of the things that conventional wisdom sometimes thinks they can. Namely, they can engage in more redistribution than conventional wis wisdom predicts, but they can, engage in, they can engage in less economic development. And finally, I claim that as an economic matter, cities have a much wider range of policy options available to them, but they are often limited by law and politics. Scholars and policymakers have mistaken political limits for economic ones. So let me start with competition. 
And the common view is that cities are competing, competing for firms, residents, and tax monies. Cities are products of, uh, of the location services market on this view. This relies on Charles Thibault's theory of a competitive marketplace in, uh, uh, in city location. On Thibault's theory, consumer voters vote with their feet by picking the community that meets their tax and expenditure preferences. They move, and that establishes their preferences. Citizens sort themselves into the places that they prefer. This competition between cities disciplines local government, promotes the efficient provision of local services, and encourages salutary innovation. But Thibault, and sometimes this is developed into a competitive federalism model, is not a theory of economic development, though we have sometimes mistaken it for one. Thibault can't explain the processes of urbanization. Urbanization is a global phenomenon. Cities develop before there are tax expenditure bundles to choose from. Thibault also can't explain why cities end up where they do. The location and existence of cities cannot be explained, again, by a set of tax and expenditure bundles. Often cities grow first and institutions follow. The history of city formation shows that infra infrastructure and services often come after cities have developed, not before. Thibault also can't explain why cities grow or decline. Average January temperatures are more predictive of city growth than anything else. Sun and car cities have boomed, but old and cold cities have started to recover too. Low taxes do not predict city growth. Economic geography, on the other hand, is a theory of city growth, and economic geographers tell us that cities are not widgets. They are organic processes. Economic activity in space is uneven. It is lumpy and discontinuous. And once activity starts, more activity, more activity comes. Once people leave, more people leave. If Thibault were a theory of growth, we'd see a much more even distribution of population across geography, but we don't. In other words, the world is not flat. So consider, Denver's metropolitan region accounts for 60% of Colorado's population. The Houston and Dallas metro regions account for 47% of Texas's population. And the Atlanta metro uh, area constitutes 50% of Georgia's population. Cities exist in urban systems, which exhibit a core and periphery structure. Some geographical space will be filled with economic activity, and some will not be. We see this at all scales. Cities have more economic activity than suburbs. Suburbs have more ac activity than rural areas. The coasts and the industrial belt have more economic activity than peripheral regions. The top 10 metropolitan regions in the United States account for 30% of national economic output. Another way to say this is that the gross metropolitan product of the top 10 metropolitan areas in the country exceeds the total gross domestic product of 34 states and the District of Columbia combined. The New York metropolitan area economy is the 10th largest in the world. Los Angeles metropolitan area economy is the 18th largest. We see this in the United States. We also see it in uh, other countries as well. For example, Greater Cairo produces 52% of GDP in Egypt on less than 15% of the land area of that country. The clustering of economic activity is not a function of the innate characteristics of places. These clusters can be quite durable over historical time, regardless of changes in governance. Economic geographers also tell us that not every city can be in the vanguard. Trying to become the next Silicon Valley or the next New York City is silly. That is because we already have a Silicon Valley and a New York City. In an urban system, there are some places that are booming and some that are not. And growth in one implies 
decline sometimes in others. And finally, economic geographers tell us that competition between lagging cities and leading cities undermines the benefits of agglomeration. In other words, we might not want people to sort evenly among cities because there are huge benefits to people gathering in certain places and not gathering in other places. That's why cities exist in the first place. If you start to try to even out economic growth in these places, you may in fact undermine the benefits of gathering together in these places. Now certainly there is sorting of people within metropolitan regions, but the provision of better public services at a lower tax price does not explain the urban resurgence of the last decades. Cities have attracted new residents without marked improvements in education, in amenities, in congestion, or in efficiency. For interlocal competition to work, cities have to be able to control outcomes. The city is not able to control the weather, preferences for suburban versus urban environments, deindustrialization, or as many theorists have said, even crime. One of the determinants of, uh, of popular urban spaces is the availability of pre-war housing exposed brick, as my students have heard me say. Cities don't control the amount of exposed brick they have or the amount of pre-war housing they have. The Tabutian competitive ideal is a theory of efficient goods provision, not a theory of city development or economic growth. These are different. And by thinking the former is the latter, we end up blaming declining cities for things they can't control. We have intuitions about this. Good public goods at a low cost is often an outcome of a booming economy in a place that people want to be. Good governance often follows wealth, not the other way around. All right, second, good policies. Remember, the conventional view is that cities can better compete by adopting low-tax, business-friendly, deregulatory policies, by subsidizing mobile residents and firms, and by engaging in minimal redistribution to the poor. There's evidence to the contrary, however. Industrial cities have been attempting to subsidize development for at least 100 years. Urban renewal, Highway building, industrial subsidies in cities across the country, downtown redevelopment, all these have been efforts that have not borne fruit. The subsidy race increasingly looks like a race to the bottom. Very little evidence. There's very little evidence that it works. The outflows in location subsidies are often not matched by local economic benefits. The Kilo case is another example of this, where Pfizer promised a lot and delivered much less. Some of our most successful cities have very high taxes and significant regulation. San Francisco is an example, and Chicago is an example, and New York is an example. Charlottesville is an example. It does much more redistribution and has much higher tax rate than Albemarle and yet it is doing fine. Costs matter to firms, labor costs do, but so do other things. You have to explain why certain kinds of firms want to be in cities that are really expensive. On the orthodox economic theory, New York City should not exist. On the flip side, no one claims that Detroit failed because of high taxes, the ultimate cause of its death spiral was a dramatic restructuring of the auto industry. High taxes come later. Finally, subsidizing the entry of the creative class, this is young, smart, artistic people and lawyers, <laughs> is often seen as a possible city strategy. But there's no evidence that it works. Indeed, there's more evidence that people follow work, not that work follows people. 
it's not at all clear that attracting young artists generates economic growth. It seems more likely that economic growth attracts young artists. Redistribution. The third area of conventional wisdom is that cities cannot redistribute. They can engage in developmental and infra infrastructure spending, but they can't redistribute to poor people because mobile residents and firms will flee. Only national governments can engage in significant redistributive spending. Now first, what do we mean by redistribution? Conventional wisdom assumes it is from rich to poor, but in fact we see significant redistribution to the rich. Again, urban renewal and redevelopment programs all through the mid 20th century were ways of redistributing uh, wealth from smaller landholders to larger ones, or from poorer people to downtown business interests. I think of redistribution as taking resources from immobile capital, which might be uh, uh, poor people, but could be other kinds of immobile capital, and giving it to mobile capital. Also, there has always been more redistrib redistribution of whatever kind uh, by cities. Uh, poor relief, schools and parks building, hospital building, all these things happened in great numbers uh, and in great amounts in the middle of the 20th century. On orthodox economic theory, would predict that those cities who engaged in that kind of redistribution would fail. Currently, what we're seeing is, uh, for example, the living wage campaign in many cities. Over 100 cities have adopted some version of the living wage requirement. Now, how are they able to do this on orthodox economic theory? Well, one possibility is that capital is less mobile than we think it is. Capital is more sticky. And the reason for this is that there are quite significant benefits to being in urban places. These are sometimes called agglomeration benefits. For example, you may have rich labor markets in these places. You have knowledge externalities, that is, uh, information sharing. What explains why uh, 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 computer manufacturers and others uh, are eager to spend lots of money paying for rents in Silicon Valley. Well, one of the possibilities is that they gain benefits from being in proximity to other folks in their industry. These kinds of benefits can only be found in places where you are in proximity with other people and industries like you, or diverse kinds of industries. Firms value those kinds of places. And so the capital uh, mobility story is going to be overstated. Here's my larger point. Economic growth and local government policies are much less connected than we think. Consider, from 1880 to 1930, cities in the United States grew the fastest. It was also during this time that cities were arguably at their most corrupt. Tammany Hall was in evidence, other kinds of corruption was in evidence as well. This did not stop economic growth in these industrial cities. Consider also that Buffalo, Detroit, and Cleveland had quite clean government at the turn of the century during the progressive era and had very good institutions going forward into the 20th century. And yet that did not prevent their decline. Cities can't redistribute if they don't have money. That is true. But getting money is not a function of the cities doing less redistribution. Finally, limited cities. The conventional view is that cities have a relatively narrow set of options dictated by economic facts. I argue that legal limits are much more significant. That is, we've mistaken political limits for economic ones. The legal limits on cities are familiar to scholars of local government. Tax and expenditure limitations that prevent localities from raising funds, debt limitations that prevent them from uh, investing, restrictions on their home rule authority, and regular state intervention into local policy making. There are also rules, uh, uh, cross-border rules, that favor suburban jurisdictions by encouraging intermunicipal tax-based competition. 
Suburban jurisdictions can close their borders to high cost users through zoning rules. They do this by restricting the amount of housing that's possible in the jurisdiction. By contrast, states aren't allowed to select population based on income. Now, there are also political limits on cities. American cities tend to be politically weak. Now, why? I argue that state-based federalism is partly to blame. States are quick to intervene when they don't like local policy, but slow to take on responsibility for basic municipal services. I call this selective localism. The city's formal authority makes regionalism, regional cooperation, less possible. And the city's formal authority tells us little about the city's political influence, which turns out to be minimal. The national and state governments rarely see cities as necessary partners in achieving state or national goals. City officials rarely exercise political influence at higher levels of government. government. And state governance is constitutionally protected, while city governance is not. Another reason for city weakness is vertical competition. Cities are fragmented politically. The state and national representatives represent the city or portions of the city, but no one represents the city qua city in statewide or national councils. The officials representing the city in the state legislature or in Congress have different interests than the mayor or the city councilors. And there is competition for credit and avoidance of blame. It, it, it is easy for state and national officials to shift costs to local governments. For example, they could create unfunded mandates or state level tax cuts that result in the locality having to pick up the tab. The other thing they do is co-opt, state and national leaders co-opt the local spoil system. For example, because there are program-specific grants, these programs can be controlled by state leaders. So Chris Christie can distribute Sandy recovery funds by talking to the mayors and asking for favors. That's a, that's a product of the ability for a state official to interfere in the transmission of monies from the federal government to the local government. Finally, city officials are relatively invisible. Local office is not a prerequisite, indeed it is often a liability, for national office holding. Only three US presidents were ever mayors. Andrew Johnson, Grover Cleveland, and Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> And you can tell me afterwards which cities they were mayors of, if you like. Anyway, to sum up my argument, we have misunderstood the city's constraints. Those constraints are political, not economic. The city's formal legal autonomy often makes it politically weak. State-based state federalism is bad for cities. Second, redistribution has always happened. The question is, to whom? Predictably, the haves have often won the redistribution game in the city. But that redistribution is not often related to economic growth. Economic growth in a city is itself very difficult to achieve through policy. Third, subsidize, attract, and deregulate isn't really a growth program. Attraction strategies are, on the whole, mistaken. Cities aren't empty vessels being uh, which you fill with desirable people or firms. They are complex economic phenomena, and we need to understand them in that way. And finally, fourth, the competitive ideal that drives all this is almost certainly mistaken. Interjurisdictional competition can't tell us why cities appear and where they do, why they decline or thrive. Urban decline or resurgence is not the losing or winning of a good governance race. Okay, what can cities do? Let me return now to uh, the themes I began with. Policy, federalism, the city capital relationship, and participatory democracy. 
As for policy, what can cities do? Cities continue to be powerful engines of economic growth. The forces of proximity, the agglomeration forces, are central to productivity. Cities can leverage that force to do what they have always done, build schools, provide health care, build infrastructure, provide public safety, invest in human capital in place, but stop trying to chase mobile people and firms. Second, federalism. What does this say about the vertical division of authority? The post-New Deal consensus, both economic and legal, is that industrial policy, redistribution, and other responses to economic restructuring are primarily national concerns, and that local efforts are limited and likely to fail. But this is only partially true. Cities can do more redistrib redistribution, less economic development, Cities, I argue, will, no, will be no more corrupt than states or nations, and maybe even less. And state-based federalism results in weak cities. We should worry about that if cities are indeed the chief engines of economic development. Third, the public-private uh, relationship. How should we regulate that relationship? In the Lochner era, equal protection and substantive, substantive due process was used to prevent government favoritism. But we are beyond that now. Nevertheless, we should be very clear that conventional urban economic development policies often advance the interests of landed elites over others. How do we distinguish between what Clay Gillette calls malign and benign redistributions? The judiciary is not sure. So for example, in Kilo, there's lots of skepticism about economic development takings, and lots of concern that this is a malign redistribution to a vested interest. And yet in the Kuno case, which involves not an uh, economic development taking, but a straight up subsidy to a corporate entity, the court expresses no concern about the redistribution from taxpayers to the corporation. Finally, participatory democracy. What does this say about the possibilities for participatory democracy? As I've already noted, there is a worry that decision-making power has migrated away from nation states toward global markets. What about cities as candidates for the reassertion of public democratic control? Cities are not just boats floating on the current economic and technological tides. Cities need capital, of course, so they are not free to do whatever they want. But cities can act much more aggressively than we thought if permitted to do so. The current wisdom about city powers and policies gives far too much weight to capital and to competition and far too little weight to constitutions. Certainly, local economic policy is limited by the requirements of the private enterprise system. And the national government is still the main site for economic regulation and income redistribution. Nevertheless, the city's subservience to capital and the nation state is not inevitable. Instead, the legal and constitutional status of the city in the American democratic order is a function of decisions to pri privilege some kinds of social and economic ordering over others. The result has been the political infantilization of the city. So let me end with a little city boosterism, if I haven't been boosterish enough. There's a long and sometimes utopian tradition of placing upon cities our highest aspirations for self-government. The connection between the city and democracy has been asserted at regular intervals. Perhaps this view of the democratic city reflects the continuing appeal of the Greek city-state, the identification of the literal city with the figurative people, the polis. For much of human history, the city was the primary political unit of democracy. We should orient our political thinking around the city once again. Economic theorists are beginning to recognize that cities and the metropolitan areas that surround them are the central engines of economic activity here and throughout the world. But our constitutional theory has not caught up to our economic theory. The city is not going to replace the nation state anytime soon. Nevertheless, I argue that if we are interested in preserving collective political choice, we need to understand and appreciate city power. 
I invoked Robert Dahl at the beginning of this talk. I want to end with him again. In 1967, Dahl wrote, quote, that city building is one of the most obvious incapacities of Americans, end quote. It does not have to be. Thank you.